Good evening, everyone. My name is Laura Hollis. I'm the director of the Jago Center for Entrepreneurial Studies uh, here at Mendoza College of Business. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of our guests to this evening's lecture in the Entrepreneurial Insights Lecture Series. Uh, before I introduce our special guest this evening, please permit me to make just a few administrative announcements. Uh, this evening's lecture is part of a class that is scheduled to go from 5 o'clock until 6.15. Our, our speakers typically have about 30 to 40 minutes of prepared remarks, and then we open the floor to question and answer. And we fully expect to maintain that schedule tonight, more or less. Uh, however, this evening, we do need to get our guest to his next engagement, and so we'll need to escort him from the auditorium no later than 6.30. So I would appreciate your assistance and cooperation with that. I'd like to offer a brief explanation of the purpose behind the Entrepreneurial Insights uh, lecture series for the benefit of those who are joining us this evening for the first time. This lecture series was created to give all Notre Dame students, and not just those who are studying business, very early exposure to as many different aspects of entrepreneurship as possible. And so the students and the other guests this term have had assumptions challenged and myths debunked They've heard about entrepreneurship through the lens of engineering and technology. They've heard about innovation, about design thinking, about leadership transitions in entrepreneurial ventures, about how to build an enterprise grounded in core values, about sustainability in entrepreneurship, sales and marketing and their role in startups, about entrepreneurial decision making and other vital skill sets. The timing of this lecture series is auspicious, I think. There's been increased interest in and attention to entrepreneurship today in the United States and around the world as cities, states, and entire nations struggle with economic uncertainty. And so one hears a great deal of talk about small business and job creation. And yet precious little media attention is actually given to understanding the climate in which businesses can be created and grow, particularly the legal and political infrastructure in which the entrepreneurial impulse can thrive or be thwarted. And so it was a primary objective of mine in this, the inaugural year of the uh, Entrepreneurial Insights Lecture Series, that at least one of our guests be able to address what I view to be a serious gap in otherwise laudable efforts of entrepreneurship education, and that of the relationship between entrepreneurship and government. So it's for this reason that I'm very pleased to introduce this evening's guest. Mitch Daniels was elected to the governorship of Indiana in 2004. After a successful career in business and government service, having been CEO of the Hudson Institute, president of Eli Lilly's North American Pharmaceutical Operations, and director of the Office of Management and Budget under former President George W. Bush. Perhaps more than any other governor in the past 10 years, Mitch Daniels has grabbed the national spotlight for his no-nonsense fiscal frankness. To his credit, he began tackling the economic challenges Indiana was facing years before the financial crises of 2008 brought the issues to the fore for so many other political leaders. He inherited a $600 million deficit, and a year later had spearheaded the state's first balanced budget in eight years, helped generate a $370 million surplus, repaid hundreds of millions of dollars that the state had borrowed, and reduced the state's overall debt by 40%. His initiative to privatize the Indiana toll road generated nearly $4 billion for reinvestment in the state's transportation and other infrastructure. The Healthy Indiana Plan, which provided health care to uninsured Indiana adults, was enacted under his tenure, and he implemented measures to make government more responsive. Indiana's Department of Child Services and the Department of Corrections have received national awards, and our Bureau of Motor Vehicles has even ranked best in the nation with an average wait time of eight minutes. Now that's entrepreneurship. <clears throat> in 2007, the governor championed a sweeping property tax reform that resulted in the largest tax cut in Indiana history, and Indiana's property taxes are now the lowest in the nation. Hoosiers responded to the governor's initiative with high approval ratings and strong bipartisan support. In 2008, Governor Daniels handily won re-election by an 18% margin, garnering 24% of the Democrat vote 20% of the African-American vote, and 52% of the under-30 vote. But sound fiscal policy is more than just a winning strategy. It is a page from the playbook for a successful business. And so it is no surprise that Governor Daniels has improved conditions for business in the state of Indiana. He created the Indiana Economic Development Corporation to attract new jobs to the state, 
from 2004 to 2008, this agency was associated with more than $18 billion in new investment in Indiana. In 2008, Site Selection Magazine and CNBC both named Indiana as most improved state for business in the country. Today, Indiana enjoys a AAA credit rating and sits at or near the top of every national ranking for business attractiveness. Mitch Daniels has also received numerous awards for his efforts to reform education in the state of Indiana, his fiscal responsibility, his protection of Indiana's wetlands and wildlife habitats, and his strong record of pro-life, pro-family, and pro-faith actions. He has received praise for his leadership from such unlikely and distinctly unconservative sources as The Economist, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and Time Magazine. Most recently, he's the author of the best-selling book, Keeping the Republic. He's an honors graduate of both Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and Georgetown School of Law. He and his wife, Sherry, are the proud parents of four daughters. Please join me in welcoming our state's chief executive, Governor Mitch Daniels. So thank you, uh, Laura. Am I audible here? Is this working? Uh, thank you very much for that generous and uh, thorough introduction. I should add, uh, I'm also a notary public. <laughs> uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for this invitation for me to be here. I jumped at it, which cannot be said of all the invitations that we get. Uh, a lot of reasons for that, and I hope the next uh, hour will, will make them evident. But uh, among one of them, it just occurred to me getting here, is one of my favorite little illustrations, I've used it over and over in talks, uh, was first uh, told me probably uh, 20 years ago by a former dean of this school. Uh, and um, it goes like this. The, it's the business school 25th reunion, and there's a good crowd there, and down at one end of the bar, there's a the guy was valedictorian of the class, and you know things just haven't worked out the way expected. He's the third vice president in a regional bank, and sort of topped out early. At the other end of the bar, the guy was last in the class. He'd just been on the cover of Forbes magazine. He's worth twenty bajillion dollars, and after two or three beers, the valedictorian can't stand it anymore. He walks down, you know, and he says, uh, "Pete, I, uh, I just got to ask you, and when, when we were here at school, I mean, you weren't too good at this, and you know, now you know, look at you, and look at me, and how'd you do it?" And uh, Pete says, "You know, Mitch, I." Uh, uh, sometimes it just, it just beats me. He says, I don't know. He says, I, I buy these things for $2. I sell them for $6. And that 4% just adds up and adds up and adds up. <laughs> Later on in life, you'll meet guys like that. Um, so we're here to talk about enterprise and the spirit of enterprise and how central it is, uh, more so than ever before, to a successful economy, a successful nation, and what, if anything, the public sector of, and those in it might do to facilitate or, or not obstruct uh, the flowering of invention and innovation on which so much else depends. I want to report to you the spirit of enterprise is still strong in our state. I was down at, uh, I do a lot of visits to schools, it's my, one of my favorite things. I was down at Indiana Wesleyan in uh, Marion, pretty thriving, by the way, an interesting business study quite apart from what it's doing academically, growing very fast. And uh, about as entrepreneurial, I guess, as a, as a university can be. So anyway, it reminded me of a previous trip I was there. I, was, I sort of cruised through the student center. And I was talking to some, you know, whoever wanted to talk and, you know, signing hats and whatever you do. And so some guy gets up, some kid gets up and walks over and he says, uh, you know, I, I said, yeah, can I help you? And he said, well, he said, yes. He said, my buddy over there at that table just bet me $20, I wouldn't smack you on the butt. <laughs> just to let you know, I have not lost my spirit of enterprise. You can guess what I said next. What's my cut? <laughs> so we settled on 15 for him and 5 for me. He gave me a good one, you know, a smack, and his buddy paid off. So <laughs> I was very encouraged, you know, that... The spark of innovation is, is still burning in our state. <laughs> a 
let me try to get this conversation going with uh, uh, two sets of, uh, uh, of comments. I want to talk first of all about the, uh, the, the central uh, place that we have uh, given to the encouragement of private sector growth and enterprise, and therefore, including, very much including, um, the rate of new business formation in our state. When I was first elected, I gathered in a hotel room in Indianapolis, uh, the first, I'm not, probably 80 or so people who had agreed to be part of our administration. No one in there, by the way, had ever been in government before. Our team had been out a long, long time. And I said to him, I said, look, every great enterprise I ever saw or was a part of had a very clear purpose. Um, it, pick your favorite buzzword. They called it their mission or their vision or their strategic objective. I don't know. It was, it was, but everybody in the organization knew what it was. They knew what they, what they were in business for. Uh, it was on the wall. It was on the laminated ID card. It was on the annual report if there was one. And everybody knew and every unit knew what their role was. The, the, the business was aligned around that objective. Everybody knew what their uh, uh, contribution was supposed to be to producing that result. And they were being measured and rewarded based on their success or failure doing that. I said, okay, fine. Here's ours. We're here to raise the disposable income of Hoosiers. That's it. Everything we're going to do is going to be aimed at that objective. Why? Because we're out to create opportunity in this state. Our concern is for those starting on the bottom rung of life's ladder, for young people starting out. And the better success this state has, or any state does, over the long haul at enabling people to raise their living standards, keep more of the money that they raised, everything else becomes easier. Um, our social and economic problems become more manageable. And government naturally has the revenue it needs to do the things we should do collectively together. So I said, that's what, that's what we're up to. And everywhere you're working, the first thing we're going to do is figure out what can you and your colleagues do, do better, do faster, which is quite often the point, or maybe quit doing, to make it more likely the next job comes to Indiana, not somewhere else. If you're given permits, how long does it take for them to be turned around? You know, time is money is not a figure of speech. Uh, if uh, we have been practicing that ever since. And um, we have, side by side with that, taken as a parallel objective, as we always say, building the best sandbox in America trying to make the conditions for enterprise in this state as positive as they can be, make it as affordable as possible to hire a Hoosier, and, as, and, and make it more likely that whatever money you risk will come back to you with a little extra, maybe, if you invest it here as opposed to somewhere else. And we've changed tax law, regulatory policy, uh, tort law. We have in, that's why we invest so much in infrastructure. We believe it's even more important to us than it is to every other state. Look where we sit on the map. Look at the opportunities for us to be a manufacturing and distribution center. And um, so uh, this has been absolutely central to everything we've done. I, I'm just going to show you a few things. I happen to have them along because of other speeches I was given, so I thought I'd torture you with just a few. Let's see if this thing works. They, told, they said it was idiot proof. We'll see. Okay, part of this was, uh, fundamental to this was fiscal solvency. Now, not only is it reassuring to business that they're not coming to a state like so many now where things may collapse, services may collapse, taxes may suddenly go up and change the business plan, but it's not just that. Uh, it is that uh, we believe by keeping taxes as low as they can be, consistent with our public responsibilities, uh, we improve the, the climate, the margins, uh, for men and women of enterprise. So this is a, a what um, uh, Dean Hollis made mention of. But the red bars are 2003, 4, and the year we came in, the states uh, was in a, uh, a negative net worth position, and uh, so we that's all got that all got fixed. It got fixed to the extent we were able to ride out the recent uh, downturn without the uh, cataclysmic consequences that happened to other states. And uh, we have a 
what we believe is an ample savings account to tide the state over, even if uh, there should be a, a double dip, let's say. How do we do it? I get this question all the time all over the country. Oh my gosh, how'd you do that? I always say, well, it's very mysterious. You know, you may want to get out a pencil. Uh, prepare to be dazzled. We spent less money than we took in. <laughs> you know, extra credit on your next exam, if you can remember that. But you know, you, you, you see it on there. Um, uh, it, it really was not particularly mysterious. There's a lot of stories behind it. We, you, we did a lot of things we'd rather not have done. We postponed some things we'd like to have done, but uh, first things first. And the compound rate of growth, as you see, is about half the rate of inflation over that time period. Consequently, we, uh, we now have the third lowest per capita state spending in the country. Um, what else is on here? Uh, we, have, uh, we have the fewest uh, state employees per capita in the country now. We have fewer state employees in Indiana in 1975. The total cost of uh, wages, benefits, and pensions in the, count, in the year we're in now is lower than it was when our administration took office, not adjusted for inflation, in nominal dollars. Uh, in, the con in the process, we've paid down the debts of the state 42%. That's, it's an interesting factoid because nationally the average is about plus 42 for the, other, for the 50 states entirely, in their entirety. That led us to have the third lowest per capita debt in the country. That led us to have the first AAA bond rating in the state's history. And uh, there's a dwindling number of states that, uh, that still do. Now. Uh, Doing all that is, as we see it, is a fundamental duty of what we do, but it's not the end of life. I already told you what the objective is. The objective is more hope and opportunity economically for people in this state. We, wanna, we want people like you to, to decide to plant your flag in this state. We want talented people who attend Notre Dame to stick around, and we want people elsewhere to hear the word and move to Indiana. Uh, we're one of the few states since the recession began that has not raised taxes. Every time somebody else does, and we don't, Indiana gets that much more competitive for the next potential investment. And here are just a handful of, I could show you dozens, but every time somebody sizes it up now, where are the best places for investment? Um, we are there. It's, the pattern is very consistent. It's a few Sunbelt states and this little island below Lake Michigan. So that's, these are the site selectors. We pay a lot of attention to these people. Their business is to advise companies where to go. This is another set of site selectors. That's the chief executive survey, more subjective, but you know, you want share of mind, as they say, the marketers say with these people, because in the end, they tend to be the ones who decide, and we're trying to establish the same reputation among uh, the, the top executive leadership of business. Now, we think we made real headway in, uh, in these areas, but the elusive and, in my mind, perhaps single most important element of all is the one that the Jago School's organized around. It's the one that this evening's organized around. We can be uh, the best state in America at encouraging the businesses we have, at lowering their costs and, and uh, uh, therefore strengthening their margins and their chances of success. We can be the best state anywhere at uh, building that reputation and, and, and marketing it aggressively to investors and businesses in this country and internationally. And, but we will not realize our potential or be the state we need to be if we don't somehow ramp up the rate at which new businesses, the source of most of the net new jobs in this country, uh, form and occasionally succeed and blossom. And this one's tricky, and we have argued about it. You know, the, the, the guy who, more than anybody, talked me into running, this is the only political office I've ever run for or will, the guy who nagged me into it more than anybody else, he had co-conspirators, co is a sensational, young, not, not quite so young anymore, Indian entrepreneur. And uh, what's today, the 15th? Two days from now, the company he built in this state goes public. It's that moment that people work years for. You know what Angie's list is? All right. There's Angie and this guy who started. And we've, we have fought, I have fought with him about this for years. Bill was a venture capitalist before he started that. And his belief is, look, especially in this world, money will find a good idea. It's not an excuse. 
he'd say, that Indiana had almost no native venture capital. It's not an excuse, he would say, that uh, uh, some of the, we didn't have programs to encourage or co-invest or any of that stuff. Um, it, it's all about the culture. Um, I'd say you cannot be completely right. And I, I still, years later, I believe more strongly that he's right, but that uh, but there's, there's more to it. That there's a hardware and a software side to this. So on the hardware side, I'm talking about tangible things government can do. We have done about all the things I could think of to do, and, but we're, the store is always open for new ideas. So uh, let me give you an example of how backward looking Indiana was. Uh, seven years ago, uh, until we changed it in our first, very active first legislative session, if you, uh, if you bought a lathe or a drill press, uh, right, or a piece of heavy uh, machinery of any kind in Indiana, you did not pay sales tax because it was understood to be a tool of work. The state didn't want to make it more expensive for you. If you, however, bought a spectrometer or an electron microscope or a piece of high-tech equipment, you did pay sales tax. We hadn't quite caught on that that's where the economy was and was going. Okay, so we, we changed stuff like that. We ramped up the, we have the highest R&D tax credit in the country. Now, we want people to invest in R&D, the kind that occasionally blossoms into a new winning good or service. Um, we, we give people a credit now up to a point if they uh, assemble venture capital. We have a significantly higher share, still pathetically small compared to our what, we, what it ought to be, but a much higher share than we did of the venture capital and of the venture capital deals that are happening. Um, and so we, we have worked on this, what I would call the hardware side, um, uh, pretty steadily. And I think, I don't know of a state that is more, is more, uh, supportive through its public policy than we are. But if there is one, we're going we're gonna to find them and we're going to copy them. I, I omitted maybe my favorite example, something that only we and I think one other state uh, has, a, has a facsimile of. In Indiana now, um, and for the last two years, if you patent, if you, if you are granted a patent and you base the business on, around that patent in Indiana, we will forgive a percentage of your income from that patent for the first several years. It's our way of saying that there's nothing we prize more than people who invent and innovate and then take the huge risks that almost always attach with taking that innovation, that, that new and untested product or service to the marketplace and see if anybody will part with a buck in order to pay for it. Um, but that's not enough. The software side is the devilish one. And I'm so thrilled when I hear, as, as, as I did from Laura earlier, that 1,800 or something like that of the students on this campus are in this school. And therefore, lots of them are engaged in not only thinking about, about the noble work of creating businesses and opportunity for other people, but, but in particular about the entrepreneurial venture, the the, the riskiest and, uh, and the boldest, but clearly the most important of all economic activity. Uh, it's very, very encouraging. And we're, we're doing all, we've done all we can do. We have an entrepreneurial boot camp. I called up some of the legends of this state, people who have started great businesses. Bill Cook, while he was with us, took part. And Dane Miller, who started Biomet, you know, all, all, these, all these famous folks. And, and uh, they, they give us time every year. They meet with young people who think, maybe I want to grow up and be like you and try to download some of what they have learned. Um, I, was, I was thinking coming up here, we've, we've had an innovate, uh, no, uh, entrepreneurial idol competition, right? One of these things with a panel of judges, people like the guys I just mentioned. And the first one was won by a team from Notre Dame. I've been checking. We checked on their website coming up here. They, they, they call themselves Smart Shade. I think they won. Ten grand. They were the leading team in 07. And four years later, they've got a business going. I hope they're, they're still there, so they must be doing something well. Um, and uh, 
Coincidentally, the, for, well, before I left Fort Wayne today, I helped them kick off their Lemonade Day. We've been doing this around the state. It's a program that actually started in Texas. But we out, Indiana now has, there was a lady from Texas here to tell me this, we now have more, of the, more kids involved than in any state in the union. What's Lemonade Day? Community, get some people together. You stake young kids 20 bucks. Uh, they borrow 20 bucks. Start a lemonade stand. There's a day where people go out and buy it. At the end of the day, if they made some money, they get to keep it. They're encouraged to share a little with, uh, with a, a good cause. But uh, basically, they pay off their bill. They do their own marketing. They do their own manufacturing. They do their own sales. They pay off their bills and hope to have something left over. South Bend should have a lemonade day, you, Mr. Mayor-elect, and uh, we'll help you do it. So all this is just by way of saying that um, from, from our own state standpoint, we are, we're still struggling with this, but we're doing everything we know how, both tangibly and in terms of the, the culture of our state, to encourage and to celebrate that, those rare individuals who tend to make the most change in society. You know, um, the passing of, of Mr. Jobs uh, was, a, was a very sad thing. But the, the grace in it, I thought, was it brought this whole matter to the attention of a lot of people who probably hadn't thought much about it. They, all the people who hadn't thought as much about the incredible effect that like, one person like that can have on the lives of others. The historian Paul Johnson begins, I think, his greatest book by saying that the, the, the great scientist or inventor, for good or for ill, has more, impinges more on history than the greatest statesman or warlord. It's true. The, that person who, who, who makes that, that breakthrough of innovation uh, is the one who, who transforms our lives and generally uh, improves them. And we need more of those people here in Indiana. And I'll just say, everything I just said about the state is absolutely true about our nation, too. You're all business and economic students here, I mean, uh, you, you know what goes into the GDP equation, and it's not very pretty for us right now. <laughs> Government's a negative drag, C plus I plus G plus, you know, right? Okay, so consumption's not coming back big time. People are going to be careful. They're going to be paying down debts, as we say, deleveraging, and they probably should. Investment, money's in the mattresses. Sooner or later, businesses will start investing, but you know, they're pretty darn cautious, and they got many reasons to be right now. Government's a drag. There's a, a whole lot more going out than coming in. Our, next, you get the balance of trade. It's a drag. As far as I can see, we're going to be buying more. So what's, that, what's at the end of that equation? Didn't used to be there, and then people realized they couldn't leave it out. And total factor productivity, they call it, just means innovation. That's the equation changer that has gotten America out of its fixes in the past and has to again. It's those, those insights that suddenly uh, produce great unforeseen and unprecedented value. And we have been that country, and we must remain. We've got, we have been that state in our distant past, and we must be so once again. So that's my main message for you. I want to spend two or three minutes on something that's different, but I hope not completely unrelated. Uh, the following is not a quite the oxymoron it sounds like. Governmental entrepreneurism uh, can, um, can actually occur too. Uh, government is the last monopoly. We distrust, we Americans distrust bigness and with good reason. We don't, dis we don't trust big, big business, we don't trust big labor, we don't trust big government. Um, uh, and we don't, and the worst manifestation of bigness is somebody with a total corner on the market. So we don't like that, and we've gotten rid of the ones that we had. You used to have to get all your phones from one company, you know, and uh, uh, that's history. Even, uh, even things like electrical energy now are much more subject to the, the uh, beneficial effects of competition. Government alone is a pure monopoly. It cannot go out of business. I just want to, I'll just sort of lay before you, and we can talk about it if you want or not if you don't, that 
Um, government is not and never should and never will be a business, not supposed to be, but it can be much more business-like. And we have worked for several years in this state uh, to deliver effective service, the most effective possible. We reward people, as government al almost never does. We pay people on a pay-for-performance basis. We measure on the old business principle, if you're not keeping score, you're just practicing. We measure everything, and we are trying to build, I think I've had some success, building a culture of both economy and a culture of, of high performance in your state government. There are 21% fewer employees than there used to be, but I can prove to you that service levels are higher. Um, BMV was mentioned, child protection was mentioned, corrections was mentioned, I could name 20 more departments, uh, that have, many of which have gone from truly from worst to first or near, near best in, uh, in class. And so uh, I hope that, that most of you will devote most of your careers to, as I say, as noble an endeavor as there is, and that is creating hope and opportunity for others through your hard work and your inventiveness and your leadership and maybe your own risk-taking. But I hope that many of you will spend some of that time also applying those skills and applying those same principles on behalf of us all in public life somehow, full-time, part-time, paid volunteer, because uh, the very same spirit which animates our best enterprises is sorely lacking in the public enterprise, which uh, you know must be done well if the, if the uh, if the private realms, to me, the important realms of life are to flourish. So I thank you for this chance to be here to tell you how uh, encouraged I am to see uh, so much talent, uh, at least interested in these, in these subjects, and how uh, much I hope that Indiana will be the place where you all go, go forth and prosper. Thank you very much. So you all just shout them out here, don't you? Sir. Um, By the way, would you, if you don't mind, just say your name and uh, maybe where you're from. Uh, I'm Jan Butler, and I'm from uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, recently, Ohio uh, voters decided to uh, go against the issue 2 or 705, which is uh, Ohio's attempt at restricting union uh, collective bargaining agreements. Yep. I was wondering if uh, you would comment maybe on the matter Well, Dana, uh, the, the bill in Ohio dealt with government unionism as opposed to private sector. Uh, and uh, also, as I understand it, dealt largely with local government. So it, it, was, it became, after $40 million, $40 million of money spent by those interests who uh, disagreed with the, with the new law, became an argument about firefighters and policemen and so forth. I don't think it has anything much to do with our situation here um, for the following reason. So, um, let, me, let me talk about unionism and government. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, George Meany, Fiorello LaGuardia, and others of the greatest champions of uh, the rights of labor back in the 30s at the time the Wagner Act was first passed and so forth, all agreed that unionism had no place in government. But it got there, and then it got there in a very, very big way. And um, in my view, in an unfortunate way, you now have government employees paid dramatically more than the taxpayers who are paying their salaries, with benefits that are dramatically higher than the private sectors on average, with pensions that are off the charts better, and with almost total job tenure or job security, which uh, the folks paying their salaries, we've seen so sadly, do not enjoy. So I do think things are out of whack. And uh, the notion of public service, as I just said a minute ago, my concept, 
as all my understanding has always been, public service is what men and women of goodwill do uh, to make certain that the important sectors of life flourish. The private realms of enterprise and voluntary associations and nonprofits and so forth. But not everybody thinks that way, and there are, there are people who believe really government must have the dominant role. Now, in Indiana, we have a different situation. We had government unions in state government for 16 years. The legislature never authorized that. It was done by executive order, which is the way it started in most places. It started that way in the federal government in 1960-something, too, maybe, when JFK with a stroke of a pen. And on my first day in office, after a lot of thought and much hesitation, I discontinued it. Um, I didn't know what would happen. I had in my, I, to tell you the truth, I imagined a big scene, you know, big, uh, uh, you know, sort of riot like what you had in Wisconsin earlier this year. But I became convinced after listening to a lot of people that if I left this 160 pages, 160 pages of do's and don'ts uh, in place, we were never going to fix state government. You couldn't, you know, pick up that coffee mug and move it over here without the permission of somebody or some long negotiation. So, with as I say, a lot of apprehension, I discontinued it, and I pulled up the covers and held my breath and waited, and nothing happened, except one thing, two things. One, we were able to go to work immediately, and I'll give you a couple illustrations, fixing what we thought was a busted, dysfunctional, wasteful, unacceptable level of citizen service across the board. And two, once it was their choice, the workers of state government, 90 plus percent of them quit paying the dues. All I really did was say, you can't be made to pay the dues anymore. You do understand the game, Dana, I think. The game is, you get people in a compulsory dues situation, you extract millions of dollars, uh, part of it pays for the apparatus, but part of it is recycled into politics, that's where the $40 million to beat down the Ohio law came from. And the politicians that you employ you know, boost the pay, boost the benefits, boost the job security. Don't think it's a good arrangement. We discontinued it in Indiana, and it is now the law of the state. It cannot be brought back by the stroke of a governor's pen again. The legislature would have to decide, as your representatives, that it's a good idea. Those illustrations, there are hundreds of them now. I mean, all the things that is business, excellent business people. You know, I said, you know, if you spend some time in in, the pub, in public life, I hope you'll bring good business management practices with you. Okay. Uh, we couldn't divide de departments. We couldn't combine departments. We couldn't consolidate services. We couldn't outsource any services. Um, we couldn't close any facilities. We couldn't have done any of that. Right after I signed that first executive order, I signed another one. I was pledged in the midst of a, I showed you how we were flat busted, and we were getting ready to cut spending across the board. I met a lady from the local child protection agency out front coming in. We reminisced about this. But I said, there's one thing that we're going to spend more money on. I don't know where we're going to find it, but we're going to spend more money. Because Indiana had the worst record at protecting children from abuse and neglect in America. And why? For one thing, we had the worst trained with, uh, workers with the highest caseloads. So we doubled the number of caseworkers in the first year. And we retrained them, and we weeded out the ones who weren't too good at it. And now it's winning national awards. I would still be negotiating that, the creation of that new department. I signed an order that pulled that out of the existing bureaucracy and created a new department of child services that reported directly to me. We would still be having some negotiation in some room somewhere. So that's why I think that we have a better arrangement here, a more pro-taxpayer, pro-citizen arrangement. Um, I hope Ohio finds a way to improve the quality of government, even with the um, system that I guess they're going back to now. Yes, sir. Are you a freshman or a sophomore? <laughs> uh, Fred Gross, sophomore in Indiana. Would you comment on your future plans once you, your term expires? 
This will be the shortest answer of the night, Fred. I don't have any. <laughs> it's something I always, I, I, I always hesitate to admit this in front of young audiences, but I am, I am, I guarantee you, the worst career planner in the room. I just never have, you know. Um, I've uh, had wonderful opportunities, and but I didn't, I didn't see any of them coming particularly. I, every so often the phone rings and there's something interesting on the other end. So I don't have a plan. I don't really think I should have a plan. A friend of mine, somebody, a former governor who I admire a great deal, dropped in to see me, uh, I don't know, several months back, brought me one of these atomic clocks, countdown clocks. And it's, uh, it sits right, so I put it right, right, right in the line of sight. And it, it's like, yeah, it's counting down. It's like 460 some days now. Days, hours, minutes, seconds that I'm still in this job. And uh, it's there, of course, is to remind me, try to use every one of those days, do something useful. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Somewhere in that period, I'll either get an idea or somebody will give me an idea, but I really don't. I mean, I think my, to the extent I've had an instinct, it's been to go back to business. And, you know, I'd love, I'd love to be part of some arrangement that maybe built some businesses in our state or brought some businesses in. But I don't have a scheme. Yes, sir. My name is Juan Manuel Segura. I'm a sophomore at the business school uh, from Virginia. And um, I wanted to ask you, um, you talked about rewards to businesses for their entrepreneurial spirits and uh, their accomplishments. Do you have any safeguards in your government to prevent Solyndra type catastrophes from happening at the time? So Excellent have question. Have and on, on top of that, I know a couple of states have uh, infrastructure banks, and I know that idea has been touted in the American Jobs Act. Um, what's your opinion on that? Tell me your first name again. Uh, Juan and Juan. Juan, thank you, Juan. Um, the first question is really an important one. You know, another of those first day um, actions, way back when, codified in the very first bill of a, of a hurricane like first session that we had uh, in 05, created a, uh, the Indian Economic Development Corporation. It replaced a, I thought, a completely ineffective state bureaucracy called the Department of Commerce. We abolished it. We created a nonprofit corporation, uh, which is, I believe, it's being copied elsewhere now. I think it's a much better mousetrap. Um, one of its, one, of, one feature that I think is good about it, I made the governor the chairman of the board to remind myself and future governors what, what job one is. Job one is jobs. And we've got uh, about a dozen of the best businessmen and women of, in the state are the board of directors. Each quarter when the board meets, the, uh, and it's the management reports, I guess the first uh, slide is the number of transactions and job projections from the last quarter. But the second one is um, incentive dollars per job. The goal being to drive it down. It was about 36,000 when we reconstructed the past, it was about $36,000 a job. Now it's between eight and nine. And the point there is you want to win by playing better poker. We routinely get a business to come here. I just welcomed one to North Vernon yesterday. We beat Tennessee, we beat uh, Illinois, maybe a third state. Every one of them was offering more incentives than we were, front end stuff. But they came here. Why? Oh, well, because those incentives, whatever they are, a little tax reduction usually, sometimes some training money. Some states give cash away. We don't. Uh, are there at the front end but, or for the first few years. But there's always a business case that assumes a long-term investment, 20 years, 30 years. And the, the cost structure in Indiana beats these other states almost every time. So we know that, and they know that, and pretty soon they figure out we know they, that they know that. So number one, we try to minimize the amount of incentives that we're offering in the first place. Number two, our incentives are totally conditional, contingent. So, you know, business is rough, and you know, people, uh, we, we have about an 83% realization rate. So business says, okay, we're going to come. We, we project we'll create 200 jobs. Um, in the aggregate, about 83% of those have been showing up. It took a little dip, of course, during the recession that we just went through. A lot of people's business plans went to hell. Um, but we only, they only ever get 
an Indiana incentive dollar for the job that shows up. After it shows up and it's certified, then we give them training reimbursement, which is usually not much, or and or uh, a, a reduction for a while in their income tax. So that's how we attempt to avoid. We do not pick winners and losers. You know, the closest we come to uh, anything like uh, what you are rightly worried about is something in the entrepreneurial area. It was not our invention. We think we have improved it. It's what we call it the 21st century fund. And uh, a peer uh, uh, applicants to the fund, this is small startup companies looking for a little front end help in capital. And uh, a peer review, the, I don't go near it, the board didn't go near it, a peer review committee picks some of these. And we have a pretty good record now of helping businesses get started. But it is a tiny amount of money. And when they make it, they pay it back. You asked about an infrastructure bank. You know, I have walked around that two or three times. I don't see the attraction in it myself, personally. I'm not, I'm not sure it's a bad idea. I just don't think it's the best idea. You know, uh, what we did here and um, has marked us. We are the number one infrastructure investment state in the country. We're setting records 10 years in a row, all from the proceeds of the toll road transaction. Um, that was a one of a kind, to some extent lucky, and certainly in terms of timing transaction. Indiana will need something new. We didn't solve our infrastructure problems for all time. We just took a huge leap forward. And, but I have not seen that as the, as the best answer. I think the best answer is to continue accessing private capital. There's a lot of it that would, would like to come in to help rebuild roads and, and other facilities. And public policy has leaned against it, and it needs to stop that and start inviting it in. Yes, sir. I'm Michael Vinci. I'm a senior political science major from Cleveland, Ohio. Michael. And um, you've done a lot to make Indiana better for businesses, and specifically you mentioned making it cheaper to import pictures than in other states. Yeah. Do you see a danger in kind of a race to the bottom with allowing businesses then to cut benefits, cut wages? Actually, not so. Maybe I'm too glib. Really, it's, I want to head the other direction. When I talk about less expensive to hire Hoosiers. I don't mean what you pay Hoosiers. I want them paid more. When I talked about more disposable income, the third slide, by the way, in that report I'm talking about is, what do the jobs that we have incentivized in the last quarter pay? And there's a line for the Indiana average, and the staff knows that the line for our deals better be above that. We're trying to average up the income of Hoosiers over time. What I meant was uh, every other cost the business has, all its taxes, uh, unemployment insurance premiums, workers' comp premiums, the cost of the regulatory cost, the, the, the direct and indirect, that you know, some states are unbelievably hostile. You try to start a business in California these days. Anybody from California? Oh, man, don't go home. <laughs> I mean, it is incredible the stories people tell you out there. I tell my, my you know, the business folks I know out there, I say, you know what, if the weather ever changes, you guys are toast. I mean, it is all you got left. So, I mean, that's what I meant. And, the, and, of course, the point there is, if you do that successfully, the business has more money to pay its workers and to attract better workers and all, and all of that. So that's what I meant. You know, get the rest of the cost structure down and, um, so Hoosiers can, A, get hired, B, earn more. Uh, yes, sir. Red. My name is Michael White. I'm from Solon, Ohio. Mm -hmm. As the governor of a state with a triple A credit rating, what advice do you have for the politicians on the national stage? <laughs> Michael. Uh, well, I'm going to give you, you talking about cliff notes, I'm going to give you, I just wrote this book, you see. And... Uh, <laughs> I think I sum it up. I would sum it up this way: um, the the problem is inarguable. It is mathematical. I, I start from the standpoint that we can have. Let's have the idiot. If you want to have an ideological debate, let's do it tomorrow. This isn't an argument about big government, small government, or any of the, any specific policy. As a matter of arithmetic, you guys are studying finance. 
no enterprise, large or small, private or public, can, th can thrive or maybe survive on the debt levels we have taken on. We're in maximum denial. It's a very human impulse. But just go look at the arithmetic. I tell my friends who do believe, many do, of course, sincerely, in a more active and, and expansive and, and uh, intrusive government than I do, I say, you know what? You've got a bigger stake than anybody in our solving this problem. There's no way you'll pay for all the things you want unless two things happen. One, we've got to focus the resources we have on the most essential spending. And two, we've got to have a long period of private sector growth in this country to pay the bills. So I would start by saying you know, that the, the problem is huge and, and arithmetic. It is, it is, it is nation-threatening in terms of, the first of all, the standard of living and that we've always that we enjoy today. But that's not the worst of it. It threatens the, what we've always called the American dream, the prospect of upward mobility in a very direct way. And ultimately, it's a challenge to our ability to govern ourselves. The book's about the fact that I'm not the great historian, but you don't have to be. Through the centuries, since the first Greek came up with the term, people have said, well, this cute idea, government of the people, by the people, but it won't work for long because the politicians will figure out they can spend and promise and leave the mess to somebody else, be short-term popular, and say, well, we're pretty much getting there. And so it's a challenge to our ability to govern ourselves as mature adults who think about the nation, who think about the future as much as the present, about their children as much as themselves. Second, but secondly, I would say, have a little confidence in the American people. Take a chance. Yeah, I know, I know about all the polls. You know, people say, oh, God, don't touch this, don't touch that. And, that's, and if you don't touch that, you, you know, if you don't touch, the, for instance, the, the huge social welfare program, I mean, you're not going to even, you haven't even begun. But I just, I think we have to have more confidence in Americans than some of our political class do. Level with Americans about the depth of the problem, the kinds of things we'll need to do to fix it. And they might just surprise you. I think they would. That's my advice. Should we let the mayor-elect have a question? Is that the, <laughs> who thinks he is? Yes, sir, please do. I'd like to see it happen. I mean, I think it's, it's more perception than reality, but there, this is not the only part of the state that sort of has a permanent poor me attitude, you know. Uh, it gets worse when you go west of here. Um, and um, I, I've, I've, you know, I've tried to work hard on this. I, I've made, uh, you know, I, honestly, I think South Bend should feel, uh, shouldn't feel that way. I, if people do, I, uh, then we'll have to work on it. But um, I really think there's a lot of upside. I really do. Um, you and I talked about it outside. But I mean, you represent a new leaf up here. That's always an opportunity to try new things. I mean, uh, I got to say, I like what Notre Dame is doing. The city and the one thing I see that's different in the last few years, of course, to me, the university and the city have begun to work together in new ways, and that offers a lot of possibilities. You know, when, when we look at the economy of this state, we see certain hubs. You know, we've got really tough spots, but where we've got bright spots, it's always around a hub. Metro India is one, but where are, the, where are a couple more? Bloomington area, Lafayette. Why? The university. Uh, and I think the maturing, if, if I'm right about this, the the growing relationship and the greater interest uh, from both sides in, in capitalizing on, on this university is a huge high card in South Bend's hand and some more imaginative things like that. You know, I'm excited about it and I think there are people elsewhere in the state who, who are and will be as we talk about it. So, um, you know, I'm not, not, I'm not trying to uh, 
be ingratiating here. I, honestly, I think your election uh, offers a real opportunity for, if improvements necessary, this is a great time to make it happen. Yes, sir. Well, um, uh, legislatively, we have not made much headway in local government reorganization or local government modernization. Joe Kernan from here was good enough to co-chair a great commission. They delivered 27 very sensible recommendations to bring our frontier era local government into the uh, into something more suited to today. And, and we have not been very successful yet. We're going to try that again. There's just an awful lot of wasted motion, wasted dollars, lack of accountability in this multi-layered system with so many politicians in it. And uh, so that's, that's one. Um, we came close last year to modernizing our criminal justice sentencing in the state. I'm for tough sentencing. Boy, we've got it. The penalties for a lot of things in Indiana are literally six, eight, ten times Texas, which is not known for being a, for coddling criminals, right? And, uh, and we, we've had a long, long look. This is something that I think people can be, one of those where people might be able to join across party lines. We kept, got pretty close and uh, it ran aground because, uh, you know, one particular interest group uh, uh, wanted to bolt things on to it, but it undermined it. But those, those are two of them. And uh, yeah, let's see. Yes, sir. I wanted to follow up on this summer's question real quick uh, about your remaining multiple term in office and speak to what did you do the intangibles you mentioned? What are some of the biggest challenges that you think still need to be addressed as far as those intangibles or culture and whatnot? Yeah. Um, you have mentioned education as much. Is that something that's on your list of things to look at? Or would like to see happen before you're Yeah, right. Well, I, I don't mean to short education. We've, we've worked long, long and hard on it. We had a huge, I think, set of breakthroughs this year. Indiana is now seen as, at least in terms of its legal framework, having maybe as progressive a system as there is in the country. Um, I could have answered Parker's question, but I could have added to that answer. Um, you know, now implementing it. You talk about a place where culture means so much, particularly the culture of K-12 education, we hope will is moving in, uh, in the direction I talked about, about state government, and getting, getting committed to results. The results that matter are, are the kids learning? Are they growing? And just because we passed all these sweeping reforms, um, the kind that people from President Obama and Secretary Duncan to folks in, you know, sort of in my uniform have, have applauded, uh, so far hadn't educated a single kid uh, any better. We hope that's starting now. Uh, but yeah, we want that there too to be, become a culture in which people know that if they do really well, meaning the kids are growing, they will be rewarded. They won't be held back just because they haven't got enough seniority, has got as much seniority as the person next door. Uh, things like that. Um, uh, a culture in which schools are not only forced to compete, but eager to compete and, and, and to, and to uh, achieve great results and then, um, and then uh, show them to their communities and, and attract students. So that's a huge set of changes that absolutely is part of my plan while that atomic clock is, is still ticking. And I'll say, you know, the, the, the broader one beyond all the rest is something that I've talked about from the very beginning, and I do believe it's occurring, but it might just be wishful thinking on my part. This has never been a state. Some, uh, those of you who are from Indiana might have a sense of this. Those from elsewhere might not. I don't know. But if you read any history of our state, they may say wildly varied things, but one, there's one common thread. This has never been a state associated with change, or as they like to say now, embracing change. You know, we're conservative. 
not in the modern parlance, but in the, in the, in the cultural parlance. Let somebody else try it first, right? And uh, our view from the beginning in seeking office was that just doesn't work in this world. We always, I've always said, you know, you tread water, you'll sink. You, you stand still, you'll be passed by. And I think, could be wrong, but I think now there's an expectation. I, you know, Parker's question, everybody's question, what's next, what's next? We didn't always used to think that way. And I hope that we will leave behind a, a different culture in a sort of general sense. And people will expect that Indiana is going to lead and Indiana is going to innovate, you know? And uh, if, 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 you don't, if you can't answer the what next question, then what's the matter with you? Yes, ma'am. Hey, you look good in green there. Oh, <laughs> I'm Ann Lindsay from Carmel, Indiana. I was wondering if you could talk about the types of jobs that you've been able to bring to the state. I think a lot of times the perception is that it's manufacturing jobs. If you could talk about like technology and services. Um, was it Ann or Aaron? Yeah, Ann. Um, well, Ann, the answer is uh, every kind. Um, you, you know, the Solyndra question that Juan asked is, is a, an important one here. It has a connection to this. Um, after we stood up the IEDC and, and got rolling, got a whole new way of approaching this underway, we did, as a, in, somewhere in that first or second year, we did work on a strategy. I'm generally kind of dubious of these. You got you know, a lot of, a lot of. I've seen a lot of businesses and good causes waste a lot of time, produce something that doesn't really add much value. But we thought, well, let's see what we can do, and it identifies certain categories that we think Indiana can be excellent in. And man, advanced manufacturing is clearly there. By the way, we, I don't think we ever want to let go of that. We have to recognize it's going to never going to employ the highest, the high percentage of our citizens before, but it can add so much value and has a huge multiplier in other, uh, has the biggest multiplier in terms of creating other jobs around it. So that's going to be there. But in addition to logistics, that was the company I, yesterday, very high-tech business, by the way, huge value. I added opportunities for businesses you might start helping people move stuff from point A to point B, the most cost-effective, time-efficient way. We've got a lot of those. We're naturally situated for it, and we're growing fast in that area. Uh, um, we are legitimately now on the life sciences biotech map, big time. And I was, you know, I was cautious about this. I was in the life sciences business. I was in it enough to know that everybody wants to be in it. I'm just sure, I'm sure Fargo, North Dakota probably has a, somebody's got a plan up there to make them a biotech capital, right? Most people aren't going to be one. We are. Between plant and animal science at Purdue, down through the Indianapolis area and down to Bloomington and the med school in between. We've got a lot of, we've got the right things happening. Small businesses starting, small businesses hiving off of the Roches and the Lilies and the big companies. Um, plenty of momentum uh, there. Um, uh, ag, and we should never overlook the value possibilities in agriculture and, and ag-related businesses, and there's a lot of those. But the reason I bring up uh, Juan's question, we, we were willing to say, look, in terms of where, we've got, where we can uh, devote our limited marketing attention, this sort of thing might be useful. But we never dream, we never delude ourselves that we can outguess the market. Uh, and that's why the sandbox is everything. You've got to build the best climate for any kind of business. Because I'm not smart enough, and by the way, nobody here is smart enough, to know exactly what the right winners are. And every time government tries to do it, it steps on its own foot big time. So I'll give you a good example. We've got an exploding IT business down around Indianapolis and other places. Uh, it's in certain niches. Uh, you know, we're not building chips at this point, but we are built, we've got the, in the permission-based marketing areas and things like that, we've got companies jumping up left and right. And nobody saw that coming. But a lot of basically young people figured out this is a good place to keep more of the money we earn. And the surprises are the best thing, you know, those are the best things of all. So... 
That's the theme of the evening, really. Uh, yes, sir. Ed Cohen, I'm a writer with the Minosa Palace here. And I just wanted to ask if you could share your thoughts on improving the national unemployment rate. What steps you might recommend? Oh, yeah, if I had the wand, I would have waved it by now. I mean, I, mean, I, I will say that I, I personally believe that um, we've got structural issues, in, not just in this country, in the world. We have overcapacity. We have a mismatch uh, of the skills Americans and Hoosiers have com uh, compared to the, the jobs that, that uh, um, are, uh, are and are likely to be available. So this is not, you know, there's no one switch you can flip. My view is the situation is so severe, and especially because it's so related, and back on Michael's question here a minute ago, it's so related to solving the debt problems we have. You understand, if, if they gave you know, any three of us dictatorial powers tonight and said, go cut anything you want out of federal spending and change the welfare programs anywhere you want, and all, and all that has to happen, we could do all of that and we wouldn't solve the equation if we don't have much more rapid economic growth in this country. You cannot get there from here. So it just tells me, as a practical matter, that we have to have a complete commitment to growth. We have to break every tie and call every close one for a, until further notice in favor of those things that are going to create growth and put more people to work. Well, what does that mean? That means that a lot of things that are very cherished goals of people might just have to hit the pause button. It's a huge triumph of our society that we live in a much cleaner world. I, I meet students all the time who don't even know this. The air you're breathing this minute, the water outside is so much cleaner than it was when I was a student or even my kids. And that's a great thing. But if pursuing infinitesimal further improvements, which may have no real material health benefit or other benefit, costs it comes at the cost of jobs and dollars and avoiding a debt catastrophe. That's not a good trade-off. This, this may be some of the hardest decisions we have to make. And, you know, I just got to say, I, I despair in the last few years. I, it, it's hard for me to name a single step that national policy has taken that didn't lean against jobs as opposed to what I just described. And... Uh, my view that's got to change. Yes, sir. Chris Davey, and I'm a junior philosophy major from Texas. Um, much of your discussion this evening is kind of like at the more state and federal level, and I was wondering what might we do as uh, individual citizens, perhaps you know, in our college years and right after, to kind of encourage the growth that you've been discussing. Uh, perhaps maybe like in like the ways that we're seeking employment, the ways that we're spending our money, our lifestyles, like that. Thing. Oh, Chris. I don't have anything profound to say I mean, I, I, that we haven't talked about already. If you've got an idea and a dream, uh, pursue it. Uh, it just might work. Uh, if, if, you, if you don't have an, you, you haven't got one, find somebody who does and try to help them get a, a small uh, uh, or new uh, company uh, airborne. Uh, celebrate those who do. And, uh, and uh, uh, when I, I have so many people come see me um, from existing businesses, and they, we talk about whatever's on their mind, and almost invariably, on their way out the door, they'll say something gracious like, what, is there anything, what can we do? What can we do to you know, help Indiana? And I always tell them the same thing. Make money. I want you to go make money. I want you to succeed at whatever it is you're doing. If you do, you'll hire somebody else one day. And if you do, you'll have some extra money and you'll give it to the United Way and the Habitat and you know, the things that we love to support. But if you don't succeed, well, you didn't, you're not in a position to help anybody. So I don't want it to sound too crass, but I got the same advice for you. I think we got uh, like two minutes left. Can we name one more tune in that time? Yes, sir. Hi, um, I'm Graham Engler from Franklin, Tennessee. I just got to ask, who do you address for the 2012 election? Yeah. No. yeah I, uh, I don't know who'd... Uh...
I mean, nobody yet. I mean, I, 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 people keep asking. I don't, I don't know why it would matter what I thought. I mean, I, I, I just told you, uh, I do believe we need to change national policy. I believe we desperately do. And I believe that's probably going to require a, a, a different president. So I'm planning to support whoever my, my party nominates. But, uh, and I hope that person will, will uh, do the things I said earlier, that they'll, uh, first of all, be positive and constructive. And I hope they'll uh, decline to the extent they have the discipline to get involved in some of this mud ball fighting that is too characteristic of, of our modern di discourse. Um, uh, you know, uh, I'll be able to go from public life, come and go from public life, three competitive elections. One was a primary and then two general elections. And I'll be able to say that I, we did that and, and we never ran a negative commercial. Uh, that is to say, we never, we never uh, disparaged anybody's character or their motives or their background, any of that. If we had a difference of opinion, we said so, but usually we, we, we testified to their, you know, that they were good people. And I hope that I hope that our nominee will try hard to do that. It won't be easy the way that this is all practiced these days. And most important, I said it before, I hope he'll trust Americans. I have a little concern. I don't know what's going to happen, but you know, looking at it right now, I think president, the president's got real problems. Every poll shows it. I hope that the economy gets moving fast in the next year. We need it here. And the whole nation needs it. So I sincerely hope that happens, but I don't right now see the evidence of it. And if it doesn't, I think he's got big, big trouble getting reelected. And that's not necessarily a good thing from my standpoint, because it could lead the opposition, the alternative nominee, to play it safe and to say, well, you know, things are a wreck. What they did didn't work. I'm not him. Vote for me. And that might be smart tactics. But if you worry, as I do, that we are very near Niagara Falls as a country, as, as, a, as an economy, then I, I really think next year has to be a time when, when somebody takes the chance to try to get the authority of the American people to go make big changes. I mean, I got my list. Maybe the nominee will have a different list. But, you know, we got we got 50 caliber problems here and we cannot shoot BBs. We got the, if we're going to have a, really have a long boom of the kind I was discussing that really creates lots of jobs and creates the revenue so we can keep up with our bills, we're going to have to make some big changes, tax policy and elsewhere. We're never going to get out of this unless we do something. I got my list, but I'd listen to somebody else's about the big uh, so-called entitlement programs. It's not an ideological statement. It's just arithmetic. And so I haven't picked anybody. If, if somebody on our side starts talking like that, I'll probably sign up. And, uh, you know, I hope that they will. I can't tell you how much fun I've had. I hope uh, you all got something out of it. Thank you. Governor, I want to thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Uh, we have a little thank you gift for you. I wasn't sure it was appropriate originally, but um, clearly it is. I know you're an Indianapolis Colts fan. We thought maybe you'd appreciate something that had a number one ranking. Oh, very cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>